BioBalance HealthCast, episode 140, Women and Heart Disease. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome back to BioBalance Health Podcast. We recently had a podcast where we talked a lot about gender differences in medicine, and we promised that we would come back and talk about specific uh, gender differences in terms of what we are now learning and know about women and heart disease. Uh, Kathy has been going on and on about information <laughs> that she possesses about women and heart disease and how uh, mainstream medicine through the years has not separated out the, the genders enough to learn these things about women and it, it, she's been on a crusade and so uh, now <laughs> other doctors <laughs> and, and other medical research are really beginning to get on the bandwagon and we're beginning to learn some things about women and heart treatments that we have not known or that has not been the norm mm -hmm. and so we thought we'd spend some time today talking about those to, to sort of spread the word and give, give you a, a platform to explain what you know about the differences mm -hmm. uh, between men and women in heart disease. There, there's many differences. I mean, there's so many differences. One of them is that we have a different, we have different diseases that bother us than men. Men don't generally have as many arrhythmia problems as women or fatal arrhythmia problems. Okay, so, so you're gonna have to define terminology here. A okay. An arrhythmia is? An arrhythmia is a heartbeat that is not. It's not rhythmic. It's, it's an not arrhythmic. Rhythmic. It's yeah. Or mm -hmm. <laughs> stop. <laughs> so basically, your heart is is not functioning normally. Normally, the atrium atria, which are two smaller muscular um, kind of uh, excuse me rooms, if you want to say, in the heart that squeeze mm -hmm. and then they squeeze into the ventricles and the ventricles are larger and then the ventricles squeeze and and your blood goes to your to your lungs and then the rest of the, the blood that's on the left side of the heart goes to your body so when the ventricles squeeze together so it's bump 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 it's very it's very rhythmic, rhythmic. it has mm -hmm. to be if it's arrhythmic mm -hmm. and they're going nah, 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 nothing's going anywhere mm -hmm. it's just it's just uh contracting in different ways and there's a little blood that goes to your lungs and a little blood that goes to your body which means that no oxygen's getting anywhere so, so it's a closed pumping system right and if it works the way that it's supposed to work then the blood is pumped around through the body goes to the lungs picks up the oxygen goes to the rest of the body and distributes that to the tissues mm -hmm. but if the rhythm is off then the whole circulation process is off right Right, and so you feel like you're out of breath, weak, dizzy, weak. exhausted. You feel you, you can pass out, you can mm -hmm. die, mm -hmm. because if if the heart starts, this is very simplistic for all you cardiologists out there. So <laughs> going, please, oh my God, don't tell please them. don't judge me on this. It's so complicated that there's an electrical system mm -hmm. that stimulates the atrium and then stimulate, and then it goes down to the ventricles, and then that that's right. gets stimulated. So if there's a short circuit and you don't get the electrical current from the atria to the ventricle. That's one way to have an arrhythmia. Right. Another way is if you have an extra beat somewhere. Sometimes just a random extra beat. Sometimes didn't you ever wonder why you had a heartbeat? Because yeah. there's this wonderful SA node, and it has a beat the whole your whole life. Mm -hmm. It works all the time, mm -hmm. day and night, and it gives you the electrical current. Well, and so when you do cardio exercise, mm -hmm. you pick up that beat. Yeah, the beat go, responds to your need for oxygen. So that's okay. a normal thing. All right. So if you have that SA node and, God forbid, you have another little piece of tissue that also has its own beat somewhere else, then you're not beating atrium ventricle. Atrium ventricle, you're doing atrium ventricle ventricle. And so it's just not pumping properly. Right. It messes up the rhythm. And the rhythm means it messes up the pump. But, but that can be random. That can be like a random electrical spike. Mm -hmm. And you can have an arrhythmia that just lasts for a few minutes and then go days and days and days mm -hmm. without an arrhythmia and then mm -hmm. have one. 
Yes, but the arrhythmias that we're talking about are the ones are the that are recurrent. Okay. They happen all the time okay. or the ones that just don't go away and that we have to shock the heart to, re, to or reboot sometimes it. stop it and then start it again. Yeah, that's done too. That's a little bit, that's more... More serious. More serious. Right. And then sometimes we can find, we don't all, we aren't ab always able to find, there's a very specific kind of cardiologist that can find this other beat. And then they can use um, a catheter to find that beat and laser it out. Oh, wow. It's very cool, but it's, I mean, it takes 12 years of school to figure, to do all this. Yeah. So, uh, so they're very specific um, uh, specialized cardiologists that do that, the ca cardiac physiologists. So they can then get that beat. But there's all kinds of rhythm problems, mm -hmm. and most of them happen to women. Not all, but women, women are much more, more susceptible to that. Arrhythmias than men. And so that's something that we, yes, we give lots of attention to arrhythmias, mm -hmm. but we have not really said, oh, we've not said, oh, when you look at a woman, consider arrhythmias because they're more common. Mm -hmm. It's just, is there arrhythmia or not, and how do we deal with it? Now, one other thing is women have a, um, often have a, a weakness in their mitral valve, and that's the valve between the left atrium, the little, the little room, the small, and the big yeah. room. Mm -hmm. So it's on the left side of the heart, which is gonna pump to the rest of the body. And that valve is sometimes flops backwards. It should just open like a door. And if you've ever had like a shower door that goes backwards, mm -hmm. it, it op goes backwards a little bit. When it's trying to push forward, it fills a little bit backwards and that's a mitral valve prolapse. Okay. So that's more common in women and that makes the left ventricle less able to push the blood out well because a little bit of that energy is going backwards. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so it can't push forward. So, we get a little weaker, and and it and it also stresses the heart. So the heart's trying harder. Yeah. And so that's that's a that's a difficulty. So these are two of the more common female problems with the heart, where men have the more common problem of atherosclerosis, where they collect fat on the vessels, and then they have compromise to the blood supply to the heart. If you ever wondered what a heart attack was, a heart attack is where the blood's supposed to be going to your heart through these vessels, and you've probably seen, seen the pictures of them. There's big arteries that go to the different parts of the heart, and then you'll see little, if, they, if you've ever had a cath, you'll see compromise here and blockage here, and they draw it. I saw a film one time years ago, of Michael DeBakey, famous uh -huh. heart surgeon, yeah. doing a heart surgery, and he had taken an artery loose from the heart and taken a pair of forceps, and he was pulling a tube of gunk out, oh, of, out of this uh, artery. Yeah. And there was just little blood flow coming out. And he said, well, I don't have it all. And he's digging around, and he said, you'll know when I have it all. And then all of a sudden, blood just starts shooting <laughs> all the way across the room. He said, right. now I've got it. Right. And he just opened it up and took all that blockage out. It's like putting a dam yeah. in the arteries that feed the one muscle you need. Mm -hmm. You know, so... So Which is that whole cholesterol thing? That's yeah, cholesterol plus inflammation mm -hmm. causes um, atherosclerosis or, or the dam in your coronary arteries. And that men are more susceptible to and that. And men than are more susceptible to that than women. That used to be true. It's we're we're coming right up on them because we mm. now eat as much meat. We now you know smoke, and um, and oftentimes women don't take estrogen for menopause, and and estrogen actually helps decrease inflammation and actually decreases collection of um, atherosclerosis. So since we've stopped replacing estrogen as much, mm -hmm. we've increased our risk of heart disease. Well, actually, uh, this document that we got out of Gender Medicine mm -hmm. uh, magazine said that heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States. It is. And it is uh, greater than the next 16 causes of death among women combined. Right, and that includes breast cancer. So you should be much more concerned about your heart and and keeping track than, of than breast cancer. Although that's cancer. certainly a very serious and, and lethal right. risk. But but, but heart so disease, is heart disease. Heart disease is yeah. worse. And it's only been recently that we've looked at men and women differently and we haven't it's not complete. I don't believe that we've given the differences between men and women and their and their hearts um, enough credit. Some of the other things are men and women respond to the medications we use for 
high blood pressure mm -hmm. and the medications we use for um, arrhythmias, beta blockers, differently. And we don't separate them in the PDR. We talked about this before. The PDR is the book that gives us all, like it's this thick and it gives PDR us all the drugs. PDR is a physician's desk reference. And that so means... So the doctor will run to that and look up drugs and mm -hmm. complications and indications and I mean it's where they keep all the data. Now it's all computerized but now it's on it used to be phone. this huge massive... Now yeah. I look at Hippocrates and I put in a drug and, yeah. and it tells me all the different doses. It, it, mm -hmm. And it does not divide between men and women. Mm -hmm. And there are differences in that. Part of that is that we haven't done the research yet on a lot of them, mm -hmm. but we know by practice that if we give a woman this drug, it won't work, and if we give a, a, a man this drug, it will, or the same drug. So we divide it up in our heads, but it's not proven, it's not proven by science, and we need to do those studies. But we haven't been doing those studies on women because the FDA didn't want to hurt um, unborn babies, but they also didn't make a provision for people who weren't who weren't fertile. Yeah. They should so what, you should not do this on fertile women or pregnant women, but you should do it do these studies on women women in general. In general. Yeah. And so which fine. they did not do. They I did mean, the not FDA do. forbade that in scientific research for years and years and years. And I don't think it changed until the early eighties. And we get a lot of our research from Europe. Mm -hmm. Because that's they were still doing research on women. Mm -hmm. And carefully, but they were still doing the research on many of these things, and and I think that's what stimulated some of the some of the uh, push plus this journal to look at women differently than men and how they respond to the um, medical medicines that we use for heart well, disease. Well, when she says this journal, she's talking about the Journal of Gender Medicine, uh, which, as we explained in the the previous podcast, was a journal that was started by a group of women doctors at Harvard who wanted funds to uh, have a journal to talk about research in women, and Harvard declined to provide those funds. And so they sent out uh, donation requests mm -hmm. to all the female physicians in the United States saying, there's a whole lot of stuff about women that's specific to women that is not being researched, that needs to be researched, and we need our own journal. Will you help us fund a journal? And, and so we all donated $300. Yeah, and, and, uh, and funded we this journal. journal, which lasted for 10 years. And mm -hmm really uh, opened the eyes of the medical community and the research community to the importance of this. And then other ma uh, mainstream journals began to do more reporting about gender-specific research. And there's a huge, there's a huge conference every year. It's, it's in Europe usually, gender-specific medicine. Mm -hmm. So, And they have a lot of new research there that may not be in the U.S. Hasn't filtered through yet. Hasn't filtered through or hasn't been accepted. Mm -hmm. So there, so it's still pro proceeding. We're still getting more and more information. But in terms of, of heart disease, women still do need to look at their cholesterol, do need to look at the inflammation. But it's interesting, in cholesterol, women have a lot higher HDL in general. HDL is protective. So I just, I just, I have to say this because so many people come to me and say, my doctor wants to put me on a, a cholesterol lowering medication. Mm -hmm. And women have a lot of complications with that. We tend to have more of the muscle aches and, and have uh, problems taking medications called statins. So it's important to look at it. It's not just a nothing drug that you can take and lower your cholesterol. So basically women usually have a higher total cholesterol mm -hmm. because they have a lot of HDL. Well, that's the good one. Mm -hmm. So it's the good cholesterol making your total number high. Yeah, the LDL is the one. The LDL is the bad one. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the LDL could be a little bit elevated, but if you've got an HDL that's elevated, it mm -hmm. protects you. Okay. So when you look down, well, you have to look at the ratio. There's a ratio of HDL to total cholesterol, mm -hmm. and they have a couple other, when they put it into this formula, there's a couple other um, uh, pieces of the formula that, adjust it, but you can tell if you're at risk for heart disease. If it's not above five, then you're not at risk of heart disease unless you have diabetes to go along with it. I mean, that makes you more susceptible. So yes, it would probably be, even if you're not at a high risk with your cholesterol in the numbers, if you're close and you have diabetes, then, then statins would be acceptable to try. But so many women are put on them and feel terrible on them and, and they didn't really need them to begin with mm -hmm. if their HDL was high. Now, most of my patients are on estrogen and testosterone, and both of those 
help so, so women, the cholesterol. Women were put on them because doctors were responding to the concern in the way that they had been trained. Right. But the training was based on the norm being the masculine norm. Right. And so now the research is beginning to say there is a difference for women and you have to allow for that difference. Right. So when they look at high and low, there should be a woman's high and a men's high. But right. basically they assume the doctors know this. So that you're going to, doctors look down here and go, oh, your ratio is fine. So you don't need treatment. Right. But doctors aren't looking at it like that. They're still treating us like we're men. Right. So they don't necessarily evaluate whether or not you need a statin. They just give you one. They just give you based one. Based on... Based uh, on what they do with all the men that have a gender a high reading of the other, yeah, right. So yeah. they're not making the difference. There's so many different lab tests that should have a male and female mm -hmm. difference, and right. you know one of them is testosterone. We know that we've we've done that, but um, they they also look at thyroid. Thyroid has a male and female normal, and we've known that for 16 years, but it is not on the lab test. So you talk about Hipp Hippocrates or the PDR. Mm -hmm. uh, are they now beginning to include dosage distinctions of these different drugs for men and women? No. Okay, so they're still rating they're still them mostly as dosages for men. Right, they're so, all dosages So an average for male men. Yeah. Uh, would be what? An average male would be 180 pounds, pounds. Yeah. 5'9". Okay, so, so, so if you're an, uh, an average uh, 180 female, pound 5'9 woman, yeah. you're still not a male. Right, And your right. system is gonna be different. But, but there are, but the, but the uh, surface area of men is getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, we grow taller, we are fatter, and you know, so, so the doses for men. Yeah, I'm tall around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, you can think that. We're gonna have to talk to you about anorexia. Um, <laughs> so when, but usually the weight of a man is much higher than a woman, and mm. the doses are the same. Yeah. And they should be adjusted. In, in many cases, not all drugs need to be adjusted. Well, what about women in hypertension? Are they more or less hypertensive than men? Is that a concern? In general, men are more hypertensive than women, and they have, uh, they have stiffer arteries earlier than women do. Women, because of the estrogen that they've been exposed to throughout their life, mm -hmm. keep, keep the um, uh, elasticity of the vessels. Now, part of hypertension, you have to understand that, is that your vessels get stiff. They don't, they don't dilate when you need them to dilate and then contract when you need them to contract. They just stay the same in all circumstances. So they don't respond to what we call vaso vasoactive chemicals in your body that tell, tell your vessels to, to open up, dilate. Mm -hmm. So men get much more stiff vessels earlier than women do. Mm -hmm. So you have to be older to have that same issue. The only catch is if you have a family history of hypertension and you have the genetics for it, then you could easily have hypertension early on. And that has to do with your family history or, or which actually means genetics. So there are some women that get hypertension early. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's men. And, and is that, going back to the previous mm -hmm. podcast, is that more among black women? than Okay, white women? so then we're talking, we're talking about, there's differences in races and, and races and, and we also talked about the fact that races have mixed so much that it's hard to say this anymore, but this is what we were taught in medical mm -hmm. school, that uh, black patients, both men and women, have higher levels of hypertension. And that is, that's one of the things that we're told to look for. You know, the minute we, we see somebody who right. is black, we have to think, oh, hypertension, kidney disease, problems with that, that's a genetic difference based on race. I have to say that that's races are melding, and so that's not necessarily. So it's not as much of a unique distinction as it was thought to be, right. or, or was at one time. Right, and and what we're going to have to do is, we're going to have to say, oh, not race, but genetic. Everything's going to have a gene for it. In fact, when I read endocrine journals now, they all have the genetic basis for each endocrine disaster that they're talking well, about. Well, and you, you talk about evolution of of science and, and industry uh, around these things. Uh, we did a podcast a few weeks ago about a company that you're working mm -hmm. with that uh, allows people to get genetic testing mm -hmm. to tell them specifically, these are things genetically for which you might be at risk. 
That's and right. these are things that you're not genetically at risk for, but you might be lifestyle at risk for. Right. You know, in making those distinctions. Yeah, both things matter. And, and your lifestyle are, and your genetics. It's not and, just your genetics. And there are other companies. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, at least, you know, we live and work in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. There, there are companies that are advertising now and mailers. that My wife got mm -hmm. something in the mail from another company mm -hmm. last week that does the same thing. So mm -hmm. genetic testing is beginning to be more affordable and more widely available as medicine is beginning to say, we need new markers, we need new qualifiers mm -hmm. by which to learn these uh, assessment protocols. It used to be so simple. Race, <laughs> everybody was judged as a male. I mean, but it well, didn't necessarily vi mean visual our Visual characteristics, were good. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we'd look at people and we, you know, it depended if you were thin, if you were very thin, then we thought of you in one way. If you were right. normal weight, we, mm -hmm. that would be in that first Ectomorph, sentence. Ectomorph, mesomorph, our, endomorph. Yeah. Male, female, white, black. It was all simple, broad categories. Yeah, it was. And now we realize there is no one size fits all. Yeah. Now, there are some generalities. We're trying to make a generality of male and female. Right. But we may skip across this, we may skip across the gender issue totally and go directly to genetics. And what's unique for you. Yeah, and you have your own pattern of what is your genetic makeup and your risk. Right. We won't ask your family history anymore. It doesn't matter. We'll have your genetics. Yeah. So that's, that's maybe that we skip past mm -hmm. a lot of these things I, in our genetic tests that we did. Um, I have an arrhythmia, and I have a risk for an arrhythmia. So the, my genetics played, yeah. played that part. So that's part. knowledge that you need to have. Right, but my family history has tons of diabetes, but I don't have that gene. Right. Now, I think anybody can get diabetes if they gain 150 pounds. Well, and, that's the lifestyle risk. Yeah, and eat, yeah. you know, Bonbons all day. I mean, not bonbons, but sugar stuff. Right, right. And there are some families mm -hmm. that that's the lifestyle. You have to break from your own training. Then you need to learn about the glycemic index. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's just all He's kinds looking of stuff. depressed about that because he had to learn about the glycemic <laughs> index. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the one thing to remember is that we're all very individual, and medicine is becoming much more individual. We are less like the race that we are labeled as. Right. We're much... We still have differences in gender, and we always will. Right. But we're going to be looked at either as more by gender or more by individual genetics. And that's important for us to know because that may make medicine much more specific and much easier to, to diagnose and treat somebody. If you have their genetics in front of you and you know, well, you have diabetes, but you don't have a gene for it, so you're doing something wrong in your lifestyle. We have to fix that. Well, yes, and, and so there's hope and there's progress and there's specificity that's becoming available. But in the short run, if you are a woman, talk to your doctor about heart disease risk for you as a woman and then personalize it. You know, my lifestyle, my issues, my history mm -hmm. as a female, what's my degree of risk? What's likely to happen? Is there anything we need to be doing? And the medicines that may be given for men, like statins, mm -hmm. you need to know to have the conversation with your physician about your heart health. It's very important, and don't let them go, oh, just forget about it, I'll think about it for you. Yeah. That bothers, that worries me. So then you have to find somebody who will listen to you. All right, and thank you for listening to us. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.